Okay. All right. Good morning. It's Bernard Nomberg with another weekly episode of Nomberg Law Live. Hope you guys are doing well on this Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And I have Rich Klein out of the Dallas Fort Worth area on the other side. Good morning, Rich. How are you doing, my friend? Good morning, Mr. Nomberg. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And I thank you for having some time for me just before the, the Thanksgiving holiday hits. And I I've got a, a, a topic for us to talk about that goes back to my childhood, and I suspect it goes back to yours as well. Yes, it does. You know, and I'm always happy to talk about sports cards. There's, you know, when you read about some of the negativity about, there's so much positivity about the sports cards that if we focus on that, we're better off as a hobby. And, you know, in our pre-discussions you seem to also enjoy the hobby for what it is because you don't need to make a living from it. You don't need to make money. You, I, I get the feeling you collect because it brings back the memories of your youth and playing with your friends when you were seven, eight, nine, ten years old. You, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> That's exactly right. I, I got out of the hobby, um, I'd say 20 to 25 years ago, just because life happens and I put all my cards in a in an area of the house that didn't need any attention. But then about a year to a year and a half ago, I found them again and I've jumped back in and gosh, what a difference. And I hate to sound like an old guy, but the hobby from when I was a kid to the hobby is now as a grown adult, it's it's night and day. And I know that, and, and I didn't do a proper introduction, Rich, and I apologize. Let me back up That's for just okay. a second. Guys, we are very, very pleased to have Rich Klein with us today. Rich is one of the industry titans, in my opinion. He's been part of the industry, and when I say industry, the sports card hobby uh, for more than 40 years. And I'm going to not do a proper uh, full uh, resume of Rich, but he was with Beckett for many years. And most recently, he's been with uh, Check Out My Cards, COMC, ComC. And Rich, I'm going to turn it over to you to let you share a little bit of your history so people know just, just where you're coming from. Okay, as you've done a pretty good job. I was, I did my first card show in 1979. Before that, I had actually started reading about the hobby in 76, 77. The first Sports Collector's Digest I ever received was the April 15th, 1977 issue. I think the January 1977 issue was the first of the Trader Speaks, which was the most influential hobby publication of its time. And then I did my first show in 79. I did some work for Baseball Hobby News on and off as like selling to stores or setting up at shows for them through 1990. I also was a full-time dealer from 1986 to 1990. And then in 1990, I went to Beckett. I stayed there till 2007, did contract for a couple of years, and then went to work at Bank of America after, like a lot of people, I got affected by the recession. And when Bank of America outsourced my job, ComC was, I was very fortunate that the owner of ComC saw a LinkedIn post I made which said, while I'm between positions, oh, that means you're, basically the email comes, oh, that means you're available. Uh, yeah, usually yeah. if you're between positions, you're available. And, oh, okay, and then a month later, I was out in Seattle for my training, and I'm approaching three years now with ComC, and it's, like anything else, it's 98% positive in the hobby, and there's a couple things I'd like to fix, but, with what I do, but, you know, when, when you don't feel like you're going to work when you go to work, it's a pretty good thing. <laughs> that, that's a great thing, um, Rich, we should all have a, have a profession or a, an interest that brings us so much joy. And I've heard you on several podcasts over the last year or so, and I know you're a fairly regular on a few. And that's what led me to you because it just comes out in the way you express yourself and your feelings about this hobby, about a sport. And when I say a sport, I'm largely talking baseball here. Uh, it's a sport that so many of us love and just find so much pleasure in being able to just share it with others. And that goes all the way back to to childhood and watching on TV or listening on the radio to our sports heroes. And speaking of that, where did you grow up, Rich, and who were some of your sports heroes as a child? I grew up in the New York metropolitan area. The, the city, the town is actually called Saddlebrook, New Jersey, 12 miles due west of the George Washington Bridge. 
And I basically rooted for the New York teams, the Yankees, the Giants, the Rangers, and the Knicks growing up. And I also was a Houston Astros fan because we used to, we did a couple, my father did a couple projects in Houston. So I saw my very first games ever in Houston when I was very, very young. So the Astrodome was one of your, your places you visited. And I I can't see you anymore. I just want to tell you, we're, we're going to be oh, live. I, I, can, I can see you and, and hear you just fine. Are you, okay. can you hear and see me? Now it's back. Okay, sometimes it goes in and out, but just just keep talking. You you were okay. you were telling us that you used to visit the Astrodome as a child sometimes. Uh, your dad right. had to visit visited the there. Astrodome. I was probably five years old, and so I was a Houston Astro fan, which leads to my three favorite players growing up: Jimmy Wynn, Cesar Cedeno, and Thurman Munson. Two Astros and a Yankee. That's well, you you, you got me right here with Thurman Munson. He's my guy too. My 8279 was a very sad day, you know, and it was, and I still remember, I think I was playing outside, you know, I'm 18, but I'm still playing outside when the plane crashed and we got word and it was just a horrible sinking feeling. And, you know, and it was almost as if he knew because like a couple of days before the plane crashed, he says, you know, I just want fans to remember me as I was stretching a single into a double and somewhere in my closet at home and I need to put it up in my office. I have a beautiful oil painting done of Munson, which is which was which I always kept up at Beckett, which I don't keep up here. But it's something I definitely need to think and get out of my closet. So it affected me on that level because you know when you're 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, and you know when you hear one of your favorite players isn't going to be around, it's a very sad day. It is, and it's still for some of us, even though it's 40 years later, it's still a very sad day. But what was a good day was a few weeks ago when he was announced in the modern class of being eligible for induction in the Hall of Fame. And there's a lot and of when I looked at the, I'm sorry, Go ahead. I'm sorry, when I looked at the 10 candidates for the Hall of Fame, none of them reached out like, okay, this is egregious that they're not in, but none of them reached out like, oh my God, if you put him in, it's terrible. And so that, that's a sign of a really good veterans committee class. Like they'll fit in. It's not the top tier, but it's a tier that works. And, and I know there's debate about every one of the players and we could spend all day just talking about Ted Simmons versus Thurman Munson. But if you look at Munson's numbers compared to Fisk and Bench and some of the historical greats, he fits right in there. And maybe that's just me with my heart and not my head, but I think he deserves at least a good shot at it this year. He, he does, so does Ted Simmons. Ted Simmons had the unfortunate part of being second fiddle to Johnny Bench in the 1970s. And, you know, nobody was Johnny Bench. Johnny That's Bench right. could have been one of the top five of all time. Simmons is probably top ten of all time, but if you're playing top ten at the same era, top five is... <laughs> That's tough. You That's a tough game. <laughs> you know, as a Yankee fan, I always loved Greg Nettles. I thought Greg Nettles was as good as Brooks Robinson. His career lasted as long. He has more career homers. The batting average isn't as good. But as we saw in the 78 World Series, he fielded just as well as Brooks Robinson did. You know, he saved game three. And when you have that type of greatness, but you already established Brooks Robinson as the greatest, all of a sudden, okay, the next guy's not as good unless he's so far superior. And and that's what happened to Greg Nettles. Greg Nettles to me is Brooks Robinson with slightly different stats. And he, yeah. you could make a very good Hall of Fame case for him. And, 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 the, and the debate can go on and on and on about so many of these players, but I wanna shift for just a minute. I wanna talk about how the sports card industry in, in during your time period now has taken such a big change. When I was a kid in the 70s, it, and then into the early 80s, we had three companies. You had Tops, and then the lawsuit that broke the monopoly, and we had Fleer and then Donruss. And then that's where I really stopped. And I know that Upper Deck and uh, Gore and a few others came through in the 80s and the 90s. But then when I got back into it just this last year or so, it really is Tops and Bowman. But oh my gosh, Rich, there's so much product out there. And Tell me, give me some of your observations of what you've seen over the last few decades with that. Okay, and I'm trying to synthesize this as rapidly as possible. 
Baseball has two licenses. One tops has both the Players Association and Properties license. So they can show uniforms. Panini has a Players Association license. Right now, it's the only four of the so-called major sports that really has two big licenses. Uh, Topps just got a license like to do stickers this year in hockey. And that, you know, and so they'll probably work on things like that to get all companies in, more companies in doing different things. And so it does bring some clarity to the market when you only have one company making making product, you know, baseball or football. They'd rather deal with 30 entities than 300 entities. It makes sense. You're a lawyer. I bet you, you know, you'd rather, you know, if you were dealing with an entity and there are 50 people in the organization, you'd probably say, can we just deal with five people instead of 50 people in that group? You know, so I don't get one. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, <laughs> and so on that level, it makes perfect sense to have one entity. Competition's good for the soul, but for the people paying the, for the people who have to pay, you know, get the money, they'd rather have one entity. Now the issue for Tops, and when you say Tops and Bowman, they're both Tops products, but the issue is that you have to pay so much in royalties to the players association and the leagues you have to do a whole bunch of products. And you do not just products that you see at the hobby stores, at the retail stores, but you have online products, you have on-demand products. All those products help pay your bills. And so you have to have what could be a more confusing market. The way the market has evolved, we can't have a basic top set anymore that, you know, that shipped on December 31st. And that's the only thing you get for the year. You have to have more options. Now, do we have too many options? That's not my. That's not something I know the answer to. I know sometimes I look and I say, "What is this?" And I say that at work. But there are other times. But I, I also still know enough people at card companies where they, you know, they'll say, "Look, we have to do this, so we stay in business." Would you rather they stay in business, or you'd rather have no cards at all? Yeah, you know, you and, hit the nail on the head about that, Rich. It, it's if I wanted to get my Jim Rice or Fred Lynn rookie cards. I knew exactly what I was going to be getting, and it was this one awesome card put out by Topps in the mid-70s. Then you get into the 80s, and you got multiple companies, but it's still only like one or two cards per company. But now, if you wanted an Aaron Judge rookie card from whatever year, you're looking at potentially hundreds of variations, short prints, etc. And that's what really was very confusing when I got back into the hobby and started studying and reading about it, going on eBay, Facebook, et cetera, my head exploded. And I'm just, it took almost this nine months to a year to really focus or narrow down how I was going to approach a pleasurable hobby as opposed to this big stress. And that's going to lead my, what I want to hear from you a little bit about what are you hearing from either on the inside from your position or from the collectors who you know in the hobby or excuse me dealers in the hobby how do they approach this everybody approaches it differently and that's one of the beauties of the hobby you know one of the podcasts there's a young man named me with Stefan who works with me in this office he's not in the office right now but he works with me he does a podcast every Wednesday night called about the cards and there is a gentleman on that named Ben, and his policy is that if you didn't want it yesterday, you wanted it today. You didn't know if you didn't want it yesterday, you don't need it today. In other words, don't chase the hot cards. And he's got a point on that. But the problem with that is a fallacy too, because things change. Players become starters. Players get to the majors. Players slump. You may want it. You may not have wanted it yesterday because you may not have realized that. You know, if the New Orleans Saints have three quarterbacks and all of a sudden the third quarterback, the emergency quarterback, comes off the bench and throws five touchdowns, you may want his card the next day. You didn't think about it because he's the third stringer, and who would want his card when you've got two really good quarterbacks in front of him? Yeah. yeah. And so there's counterbalances to everything. So I think you hit it correctly. You took a while. You studied. And you found what your niche would want it to be, which is I want to get X or Y. 
you know, some people will want to do the 70s and just get their Rice rookie number 622 or their Lynn, rookie, Lynn rookie number 616. You know, or their 70, you know, or the Brett rookie and Yount rookie 223 and 228, you know, and work on their sets slowly. Other people will just buy the set because it's not that expensive. You buy back your childhood, 79. Okay. I talked to John Newman's podcast and he talks about getting a Reggie Jackson card out of the very first pack he got when he was seven years old. What's going to hook you better than getting your hero in New York when you're seven years old? That's you know, exactly right. And, I don't have a problem with people buying hobby packs. I don't have a people with buying retail packs. There's a store near me and the manager used to say, Rich, you know, if you have $20 in your pocket and you really want to buy cards and you don't want to buy a few packs, go to, you're fine. Go to Walmart, go to Target, get the $20 blaster box. You know, you're getting cards and if you got something good, you can still bring them in here and sell the better card. We're not going to say no to a card we can sell for more money. So they had it correct. Whatever gets people into the hobby works. Whatever you do as a collector works. Whatever, whether you just do vintage, whether you do new, whether you chase the hot cards, whether you look for weird variations nobody else has, you know, whatever, you know, that's really intense and sophisticated. But whatever you do is the right decision for you. Budget your money, spend what you can afford, and do what, and do what the right thing is. I hope you guys are listening to what this man has to say. If you're interested in the sports card industry, you really have got to listen to Rich. He's been part of the industry for, for 40 plus years now with Comp C and doing a job. No, it's not a job. It's a hobby. It's a labor of love. It's something he truly enjoys doing every day. This man has forgotten more than we'll ever know about the sports card industry and if you're just joining us is rich klein with me today and i'm so happy that we're having a conversation about the where we are in today's today's hobby it's so different you've got you with the onset of, of social media youtube and, and breaking rich i had to learn all the new lingo i had to find online dictionaries just to tell me what all the acronyms stood for i had to find a uh, private uh, Facebook groups, uh, closed Facebook groups, um, just to find my, the neighborhood where I wanted to hang out, so to speak, where I could ask my basic questions. And I found one, uh, David Reyes has a great one called SVA Card Collectors. And we've, we've even, and I don't know if anybody else does this, but Rich, are you aware of folks on Facebook or on Instagram or anywhere else who does an online trading card night? You ever been part of one of those? I know there's one that's related to the national because I know Com C was involved during the national and online trading night. That's so we have a social media director, and he also has an assistant, I believe, out of the Boston area who was doing stuff during the summer when he was in college, and they did the work for the Instagram trade night. I'm not on Instagram, or if I am, I don't pay any attention to it. So <laughs> I need to get in touch with your people because we we've been, we've now done two this fall on Facebook. And we create albums and we've got all of our folks online uh, either live like you and I are doing or they're monitoring it through the Facebook live feed and we had so much fun and what what happens is the first part of it is actually trading buying selling etc but then the second part becomes a roundtable discussion with everybody from different parts of the country sharing their ideas and thoughts on the hobby and it's so much fun and uh, I've never been like part of that I've never been part of a, you know, a trade night like that, but that sounds like a fun event. It, that it sounds is, like and I'm going to invite you to our next one. I don't know when it's going to be, but I'll, I'll get word to you. Uh, Rich, I want to talk to you about, before I got back into this, the last several years with, with the popularity of YouTube and Instagram with live video feed, breaking, busting open a box of cards and, and selling packs has become such an explosion of popularity. Have you ever been part of that? What are your thoughts about that, that popular uh, concept? I am generally in favor of breaking. Done right, breaking is one of the best things that can happen in the hobby. Mm -hmm. It gets you more product out in the marketplace and a way to do it. Art companies have been a big fan too because it guarantees sales of their product. And, you know, depending on how the break is done, you know, if you're, a, let's say, a Kansas City Royals collector, 
right now you can probably get into any break if you want the Royals reasonably cheaply and just get a whole bunch of, you get all your Royals cards and say thank you and finish with your product. If you get a hit, great. If not, you've got your base cards and you're still happy. Um, so on a general level, yes. Are there problems with breaking? There's problems with everything. But I go to the breaking pavilion at the National. It's one of the, it's a hopping room. It's really been cool. The breaking area is really cool. And they're breaking stuff at the National. And one of the few downsides is that it does provide a bit within the hobby of a glut of the more base cards. But I'm okay with that because we're not, re, we're not recharging the 80s and 90s, what they call the overproduced or the junk wax era, because we know those base cards aren't going to put everybody through college. You know, all the parents bought these cases, bought these boxes. I'm going to pay for my kids' college education with that. Well, if everybody's doing that, then you've got a problem. Uh, that's not happening today. So at least on that level, we're not doing the fallacy of, okay, we're going to pay for our kids' college education or we're going to have a nice retirement. Most of the people, at least, are enjoying what they're doing on both sides of the breaking. And some are great breakers and some, obviously, in this business aren't. And we want to try to focus as much with the people that do a really good job breaking. Most of the people at the National are top-notch breakers. And I know a couple people locally who do breaks that are perfectly fine too. So, you know, those are the people you want to support. Do you have to dig around a little to find them? Yes. Is it worth it? Yes. Well, it, it's, you've led me to two other topics that I want to touch on. And one is, is what you mentioned, the overproduced or the junk wax era. From the sometime in the 80s to sometime in the 90s, they just seem to have overproduced so many cards that have become really devalued most, if not uh, all of the, the common cards, if not the others as well. But with the grading concept that has come along in the last 15, 20 years, slabbing cards, having them professionally graded and put between two pieces of plastic with all of the information on it, that then creates the marketplace, which largely is online, say eBay, et cetera, it seems like there's now a resurgent in some of those, even the most basic of those junk wax era cards, that if they're uh, the, the top grade, they may then turn out to have some value because there's the population of them out there in the marketplace is so few. But here's my question. I'm sorry for such a long-winded description. That's fine. But there seems to be so much out there for sale online, whether it be eBay, Instagram, wherever, do you have any concerns that we could be entering the second phase of a of an overproduced or a junk wax, a bubble wow. burst? That's why I was saying that on a different level, we don't have quite the same issue as we did during that era because people aren't putting cards away for college education. You know, right. so mostly a lot of the people who get better cards just flip them. You know, and that's okay. If you can make a quick profit and buy other things with it, that's fine. Now, one of the issues is that we talk about grading. Again, there's always issues with something, but on the most basic level, grading's actually good. And what I mean by that is 99% of the cards are accurately graded. And if I'm buying a card from Bernard Nomberg and I don't know you, and you say the card is mint, I may get us it. What the heck is this mint? This got a crease or whatever. If I see a card come with a PSA or a B, BGS nine or an SGC ninety six or nine or whatever they're using now, if I see that come in that way, I've got a pretty good idea what I'm buying. That it's truly a mint card. And if it's truly a mint card, especially from that era, and there's a premium for it, I'm happy to pay it because. I have a better idea what I'm getting than if I'm just going by eyesight. I can't, you know, I look at a card, sometimes I'll put a magnifying glass on just so I can make sure I do at least a quick inspection before I put them for sale for myself. <laughs> Excuse me. And, but I look and I say, okay, this is a nice card. All right, I'll put it here. Or this has crease in it, I'll put it here. And that's about the extent of how I grade a card, you know. And I look at the corners, okay, you know, unless, you know, basically I'll do 10%, 25%, 50%, there are 75 or 100%. That, that's basically, I try to keep my grading percent simple. 
But if I got a PSA 1 69 Mickey Mantle, I know, okay, I know what I'm getting there. It's going to be an ugly looking card, but it's a 69 Mantle. If I get a 69 PSA 10 Mantle, I know I got a card that's going to look awesome. And somewhere in the middle, I've got a card that's going to be eye appeal and look that way. But I have a pretty good idea what I'm buying. And so that's why I look and appreciate what grading has done for the market, because it's made the internet world a lot easier to deal with than rather being a wild, wild west. And, and it certainly can be the wild, wild west online, because everybody, including myself, has a online page on one of the social media they're trying to sell or trade their cards that they no longer really want in their personal collection, their PC. But I've got a question for you from Scott, my buddy up in, in uh, Indianapolis. The question is, I've never been to the National. I know next year that it's in Atlantic City. You've been many times. What are your advice for somebody who's never been? This can be a really overwhelming experience. You know, I, this year was the first year in 35 years I was not overwhelmed when I went in the door of the National. Oh, wow. Otherwise, I'm usually overwhelmed. But prepare. There's a few things I always tell people. Wear the most comfortable shoes you can find. Whatever money you budget, if you can budget two or three X of what you bring, do so. <laughs> Don't. And if it's, you know, what? let me ask, what do you collect? Personally? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Thurman Munson is my, my guy, so I try to collect his cards. And then really I'm focusing on late 60s to late 70s, that time period. Okay, so let's say your goal was a BGS 9 point, a BVG 9.5 or a PSA 10 or an SGC 98 or 9.5 Thurman Munson rookie card. That would be the case where, okay, if I saw one at a reasonable price at the National, I would tell you just buy it because the odds are there aren't that many if you were comfortable. But if you were just looking for a Thurman Munson rookie or just, you know, the 72 Munson or the 73 Munson, you know, or all the other Munsons, I would tell you make notes, shop around. You don't have to buy it when you see it immediately. But if it's something that you know that's really tough and the price point's really good, just buy it. But if it's something that's normal every day, 77 months in, five ten dollar car, you know that if one dealer doesn't have it, probably three devils down they'll have it. You know what? Then just wait until you're comfortable or you have a good rapport with some dealer and just buy it from him or her at that point. Enjoy the national. I would tell you to enjoy, just enjoy being there. There's so much to do. I was talking about the breaker pavilion. You get a chance to meet the corporate. You know, you get to meet Com C, but you get to meet Tops. You get to meet people from Beckett. You get to meet people from Upper Deck and Panini. And you get to meet people from Leaf and all the other corporates and some corporates you haven't heard of. And that's okay. And that's good because you're, go, you're getting FaceTime with people that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. I would always recommend getting a VIP or a super VIP package if you want to get some free autographs. You know, there's always autographs available. You know, and there's an autograph pavilion, and that's a separate show unto itself. So there is almost right now like four shows going on within one of the national, which makes it so overwhelming. You have the autograph pavilion, you have the breakers pavilion, you have corp we'll call it corporate row. It's sometimes broken up a bit, but we'll use corporate row as the simplest term. And then you have the then you have the card show. So you've got so many disparate elements that it can really be overwhelming. But if you focus on one or two things at a time, you'll be better off. Follow-up question. If, is the national, in your opinion, a place, somebody who's visiting, not a dealer, has a table or anything like that, somebody who's visiting, is it a situation where you can bring cards to trade or is it largely a buyer's situation where you just better bring your cash? It's like any other show. You can bring cards to trade. Just remember the dealers have huge expenses getting there. You have to figure a dealer is, most dealers, and I sat and did with a friend of mine who set up this year. And we sat and we did the math before the show. And for him to do the national, it cost him 55, somewhere between $5,500 and $6,000. Now, when you're laying out $5,500 or $6,000, you either have extra money in your pocket and you're doing it as a hobby, you know, hoping that you get most of your money back, and then getting a little bit of a vacation while you're there, 
or you've got to make some serious coin. Yes, you can bring cards to trade, but you have to understand this isn't a local, like I run local shows in Dallas. Those are $40 a table, or my synagogue show is $35 a table. You know, you can bring cards pretty easily to trade when a dealer only has to spend $35 for the table and maybe $10 in gas to get there, you know, and at the synagogue, we feed them lunch for $3 a person, basically. So if they're spending $50, for them a trade is no big deal. Multiply that 50 by 100, a trade becomes a big deal because then they'd rather have cash in their pocket. So sure. you've got to trade up for the dealer. You can't assume that the dealer is going to trade in your benefit. Talk to me a little bit, Rich. Let's, let's pivot away from the, the, the national, and I appreciate your time. And we're getting a little closer toward the end of our conversation. Uh, and if you guys have any questions or comments, uh, just throw them, throw them here, and I'll get those to, to Rich. This is a, a big open-ended question, Rich, but, but with your history and what you've been through and seen in the hobby, do you have your crystal ball to kind of predict where the hobby's going at this point? I have no idea. I, I tell people this story. In 1991, I got, and I still have the article, so I can talk about it. I, the PSA 8 Wagner, I said, well, based on what's going on with the market, oh, it should sell between 150 and $200,000. Well, who knew there was going to be multiple bidders, including, you know, Wayne Gretzky and Bruce McNall, who was then the owner of the Kings, and it went for a half million dollars. At that point, I put away my crystal ball and says, never again. But I think one thing I can guarantee you is that whatever level we end up at, a collector will always collect. There will always be a place for people to chase their Thurman Munson cards. There will always be a people to finish their old sets or their new sets. You know, as long as we're in the retail markets, the Walmarts, the Targets of the world, there'll always be a way to get some people just to buy packs to play with. You know, I look and there's also magic packs there. So, you, you know, if you transfer some of the kids from those packs to sports packs, it's a good start. So we will have a hobby. Where it's going to be, that's, I don't know the answer to that. You know, but will, we con will there continue to be things? Absolutely. Every day I see things coming for Comp C and I look at some of what comes in and I used to think I was all that. And with the stuff that comes in, I say, I know so little because there's just stuff that comes in every day, old, new, borrowed in blue that I've never seen or heard of before. Wow, that's saying a lot considering where you've been and what you do. But maybe the better question would have been trimming scandal and other news and, and FBI, all those issues aside, do you see the hobby as being a healthy hobby right now? That should have the been the better question. Is, the hobby is thriving right now. It's It hasn't been healthier in years. The economy's been good for a long time. And the generation of the 90s, my old friend Nick Redwine, who along with his wife Debbie used to own Nick's sports cards in Richardson, Texas, now owned by a nice man named Dean, always used to say, well, you know, and he had had the store for almost 30 years. I would lose some kids to the three C's, cars, cuties, and college. <laughs> now, the era of the kids that collected in the 80s and 90s, they're coming back. They have money in their pocket. They've established their position. They are either, their families are either a little bit older or they're getting families, but they're settling down to hobbies to pass on to the kids. And I see if 10% of the kids that came in during the overproduced era come back, and I think that may actually be close to an accurate percentage. That's a huge percentage of kids coming in and bringing new people in with them at the same time. So we're having a renaissance almost similar to the 1990s again, where it's a wonderful world, you know, and people are really enjoying the hobby based on what level they are. And I listened last week to your wonderful interview with the rabbi. Thank you. And what I loved listening to the rabbi about, and I'm going to give the listeners a sneak peek, and that's going to be something of a basis of my GTS column, which I'm going to write in the next 24 to 48 hours, is the world has changed, and we have to figure out more ways of bringing the hobby to you. The old, you know, we have shows. Shows are a good way to get people in, but it doesn't get everybody in. There are more stores now. Breaking has really helped get more stores back 
because some of the card companies want you to have a physical brick and mortar presence to do breaking. So it's really actually boosted stores, boosted shows, and you know the online is boosting too. So we're in a thriving position, and the whole key is, yes, there are going to be bumps. You mentioned the trimming scandal. You mentioned all that. And yes, that's a bump. And that's a bump we have to pay attention to. But 98% of the people in the hobby are good. And let's focus on the 98% that are good and let the 2% get dealt with as they will be. I want to, as we're, we're winding down, I don't want to, to overlook, I know that you host at your synagogue shows a couple of times a year or how often. Tell us a little bit about that, Rich. Well, you know, I've told the story, so they're a little sick of it at the synagogue, but because I told the story, I was treasurer of the Brotherhood, and I said, you know what, you know, we've always been, you know, it was always a struggle for money. We're a mid-level synagogue in terms of family, you know, number of families and how much money we have. We don't have any mega million dollar people, so, you know, we've always, it's always been hard, and I said, I'll make you $500, I'll run a card show. Okay, well, we finally got that done. The first card show was so successful that we went to twice a year immediately, which is where I stay at. And it's brought us to the point where the Brotherhood, and this may be the only synagogue in history that has it right now, the Brotherhood has more money than the Sisterhood. The don't to give back. <laughs> yes, that never happens. <laughs> but it, and partially that's because of Texas state law. And you're a lawyer, so you'll appreciate this. Well, I didn't know this. Texas state law prohibits nonprofits from having more than two raffles a year. Well, I was doing 10 door prizes a year. That could be construed as 10 raffles. So I was breaking the law with every show. So one of our Brotherhood president at the time was in the hobby in the 90s and remember this dealer who would bring, bring grab bags to the show with him, with a prize, and the prize was always worth the dollar you paid for the grab bag. And he says, why don't we do a grab bag and put a prize slip inside? Well, of course, when you're giving, then, then you start giving people free cards for showing up and making a suggested donation, and then they're getting good cards and they keep buying more. Uh, Stefan, I was telling you about, he found some card that he put on ComC for $400 out of one of our bags. Some, Evan Mathis serial numbered cards because Evan Mathis buys back his own cards because he's a big time card collector. All of a sudden, people say, whoa, wait a second, free cards or cards for a dollar and a prize. And we've given away some really, really good prizes. So it's a really good hit, you know, and I keep the show to 40, you know, the room only fits 43 tables. And so I'm not going to expand it. You know, I take a couple tables, I put out a dime quarter box, so I don't have to really focus on, you know, the cards I have for sale. If something happens, no big deal. If I make any money, no big deal. It, it is what it is. And then we have a couple prize tables. So we have, and I'd like to have a couple tables open for people to sit and trade. So we really have about a 35 to 40 table show. And, you know, the Seneca, you know, so it's really worked. And a dot is located to 6300 Independence Parkway. Plano, Texas, 75023, and we're in a shopping center. We're building our own building, and we're very conservative about that. We're not doing anything in building our own building that is something going to put us into multitudes of debt. And so for next year, we will still be at, the, at this shopping center location. It's a great location for what we do, and it's really accessible for a card show. And when is one the of the next things. The when next one the is the second Sunday in March. Okay. And the reason we do that is we don't interfere with the synagogue uh, and their Sunday school. We do it when there's no Sunday school, and that's when Plano, Texas spring break begins. And then they also do a two-day show Sunday and Monday of Labor Day weekend. Very good. Bet and so that's I bet you already know this. Evan Mathis is from about 10 miles from, my, from where I'm sitting. From Birmingham. I didn't know Alabama. where he was from, so thank you for telling me that. How about that? And he played at the University of Alabama before he went into to the pros. Uh, and, and I've heard his famous story about the Mickey Mantle card. Uh, so yes. that's 
But where can people find you if they want to read your blog or get in touch with you publicly? How do people reach out to you or find well, you? Well, I, you know, I'm on Facebook. I'll, I'll respond always on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. At Sa I'm Saber Geek on Twitter. My GTS column is at Klein's Corner with both Ks at, at GTS Distributing. And the last one I wrote was something that was very near and dear to me because I'm, in a, I'm gonna use the word stuck here for a few days until we switch positions. Uh, my wife got a kidney transplant yesterday up in New York through a wonderful Jewish organization called Renewal. And her mom is with her, but her mom is a little bit older and can't stay the whole time. So we're gonna switch roles and I'm gonna go up to be the care, caretaker, you know, probably next week or the week after we have to work out you know, it becomes, a, you know, a, a sequence. And when, you know, when you talk to the rabbi and he talked about going to the community, you know, our rabbi knew I was involved in our community and sent me an email that renewal was coming down. So I reached and I wrote about how I reached out to them, enjoyed hearing the Brooklyn accents on the answering machines, you know, while I was getting a hold of Rifka, who is one of their coordinators. And then I later spoke to the rabbi and I forgot his name. So I apologize for that, who's a, really funny man and really cool and we when we got you know my wife involved in the event so we didn't have to run a third we didn't have to run a separate event for that which was you know time saving and we're blessed we we registered with them about six months ago it's about a six-year wait in dfw for a kidney we got a kidney through renewal in six months and that's all through being involved in the community and that's uh, and I don't want to proselytize, but that's something for all the card people out there. Share, join your community, do something, bring bring yourself out there. Don't don't hide that you collect. You can hide what you have. You know, if you have a mantle, I, if you have a Wagner, I don't want to know about it to some extent. I have a friend of mine down here with a Wagner, and I went to his home and we went through his collection, and he shows it to me, and, and I said, I don't want to know you have this. <laughs> but you know, and then the next night I'm you know I'm at dinner with my wife, and I tell her and. And I told her all the really cool things. Oh, by the way, here's a Wagner. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, by the way. Oh, by the way. Oh, yeah. that, that got her attention up. Uh, even she knows what the Wagner is. And, right. you know, but, but the point is you don't have to tell people what you have. But you tell people, I collect for the fun of it. You know, I've done a whole bunch of podcasts with Jim Beckett. You know, and Jim is levels above me. And Jim's a really good person, you know, uh, you know, and I'm going to be, you know, and I'm going to, and he's helped me now making sure I have enough money to make sure when I go up to New York that it's taken care of. You know, he's helped on that as well. He's really good person. You know, he says, you've done a lot for the hobby. We've got to give back to you. But, you know, I do his podcast and he's doing the same thing you're doing, positive orientation. Tell the good stories. You know, don't tell the stories about, you know, who ripped off whom. Tell the stories about how they were good with how good with kids. You know, there was a guy he interviewed at the show this weekend. We did a show in Louisville, Texas, and he put this guy Jimmy Fisher on his podcast. Jimmy gave every kid who came to his table a free something. Here, it's on the house. Then you can buy something, but here's something on the house, and please get something good. And he worked within a price level. And I mean, I bought diamond quarter cards from him. Jim bought diamond quarter cards from him. You know, a little secret with Jim Beckett is that we were talking about the national with all the money Jim Beckett has, you know what he's happiest doing at a national sitting at a dime or a quarter or a 50 cent box or a dollar, just sitting there. And there was a table last year at the national on Saturday. He sat six hours at, and I, and I, every once in a while, people, you know, people, I'd bring people over to talk to him. He was a little, one of them was a little too loud. The others were all quiet. So I asked the guys, and I said, Jim, the guy sitting next to you, did he have any wonder why I kept bringing people over to talk to you? And he says, no, the only conversation we had, uh, I'm done with this box. Do you want this one? Are you done with that box? Uh, yeah. You know, what can we move? And that was their entire conversation for six hours. Just pure joy. But Rich, it that's, it, it, I know, I know you, from little knowing you and our conversation, you're not the type who brings a lot of attention to themselves. But I've, I've listened to Dr. Beckett's podcast for however long he's had it on now, and I've heard you on it. But that just speaks volumes to who you are and giving back to the hobby as well. So I certainly wish 
all the best to your wife and, and safe travels. I could talk to you for the next several hours, but I know we both have a lot a lot to do. And, and one of our buddies in, in one of my groups, Steve, wants to give you a shout out from Brooklyn and wishes you and your wife much, much luck and, and well wishes. Well, tell, uh, Steve I'll see him when, tell Steve I'll see him when I come up to the New York area. Tell him to reach out to me and we'll figure that out. Knowing Steve, I bet he'll do that as well. So very good. But guys, sadly for me, probably a relief for Rich. We've got to conclude our conversation for today. Um, Rich, anything in, in final you want to share going in going into this holiday? No, no, thank you for having me. As I said, yesterday was a holiday blessing in itself. You know, the biggest snafu we had was that the donor went to the wrong hospital yesterday morning. <laughs> and then I couldn't get and then I couldn't get a connection on my phone. I I don't have a smartphone. I have one of these wonderful old phones because, <laughs> I, you know, despite the fact we're doing this, I'm not always technologically savvy, despite what, you know, but I, I'd rather just have simpler things because I'm I'm really a simpler person deep down. And But we're blessed. We got a kidney, you know, dialysis, hopefully. And there's a one of my customers, a nice man named John, actually is a warehouse manager for Fresenius, the group with Dina was getting her her dialysis with, and so I saw him as I was leaving Sunday. I said, John, I'm sorry, I don't think we're going to have, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be using your services for a while. And he laughed and he says, no, that news, I'm always happy to hear when somebody's not using our services. That's the best news I ever get. So, you know, whatever it is, just stay in the community and reach out, and that'll be the extent of my sermon for today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rich. I truly enjoyed our conversation today, and I wish so you the best I. family. Guys, Thank that's going to so conclude us. Absolutely, and I hope to revisit it again another day. Uh, guys, that will conclude us for another episode of Nomberg Law Live, as we try to every Tuesday at 10 o'clock Central, 8 a.m. Pacific. Hope you guys have a great holiday and Thanksgiving and rest with food, family, and friends, and we'll catch you again next week. Take care.